Hello, and welcome back to Learn Acadian. On this episode, I'm going to talk about the dual form. So in addition to the singular and the plural, the Akkadian language also featured a dual form, which was used to reference specifically two of something. So this was often used when talking about different body parts where you have two appendages, like two ears, two eyes, or two hands. And here I have an example using the word burkum, which means knee. And I put the nominative case on each of the stems to show that just like the singular and the plural, the dual form is also going to take its case ending by just adding it to the stem. And the dual form is going to have three different case endings for the nominative, the accusative, and the genitive. So here we have burkum, which means knee, specifically one knee. Then we have the plural, burku, which means more than one. So this could still be used for two knees, but it's also broader than that and could mean four or maybe a hundred knees. But then burkan is specifically talking about two knees. So that's when the dual form would be used. And this was not extremely common in the Akkadian language as it was written on Himurabi's code or in literature, but it could be used and it was often used when talking about body parts specifically. So here I have each case ending for the dual written for you. So for the nominative, it's gonna be a long A and an N, on, which is gonna be added to the stem. For an accusative, it's gonna be a long I and an N, in. And for the genitive, it's gonna be the same in. And these are both gonna be added to the stem and it's gonna look identical. So again, you're gonna to have to use context to differentiate between the accusative and the genitive dual case endings. Now also an important thing to remember is with the dual, there's no difference between the feminine and the masculine. So if there's a feminine, like uh, for example, katam, which is a feminine for hand, this is gonna look the exact same with the ending as a different word, like our last example, burkum, which means knee and is a masculine. So here I have an example of each case ending added to different words. So this is uznum in the singular, meaning one ear. And then if we were to add the on ending, it would be uznan, dual, which means two ears in the nominative case. So that means it's gonna be the subject of our sentence. The accusative would be in. So here we have katam, which means hand in the accusative case. And it's gonna be katin to mean two hands as the object of our verb. Our last example comes from the word inum, which means I, and it's using the genitive ending, which is a long I and in, in, to get inim, which would probably be found somewhere near preposition because of the genitive case. Adjectives, which are related to dual nouns, are gonna use plural ending. So here I have an example using the word katan, which means hand, and it's a feminine noun with the nominative dual case ending. And our adjective is danum, which means strong, and in order to make this agree, we're going to use a feminine plural nominative ending to get katan denatum, or two strong hands. So dual adjectives and plural adjectives have the exact same endings. But remember, the gender is important when deciding what two words agree with one another when translating. Verbs used in relation to dual nouns are going to take the plural feminine endings. So whether or not the dual noun is a masculine or feminine, this is still going to be the case. And here I have an example using burkan, which is a masculine noun, which means two knees. Il puta, which means touched in the feminine plural. Ertsetam, which means ground. So this means the two knees touched the ground. And as you can see here, the noun burkan is going to be in agreement with this verb because it's using the feminine plural based off this long A and this I. So that covers what you need to know about the dual. And here I have a cuneiform example for us to practice what we've learned. Now what I recommend doing is pausing the video and using the sign list in Akkadian Dictionary, which I've linked in the bio below, to try to translate for yourself. Also, if you want to try to translate only from transliteration, you can wait and I'm going to pause halfway through so that you can also give that an attempt. All right, so I'm hoping that you've already translated it and we're going to go over what each sign means. So here we have the Ka tu ga sign, followed by the ta sign, and the God determinative, which would be used if there was a God's name, you would put the God determinative at the beginning. Then dinger, which is a sumerogram, which means ilum, which is Akkadian for God, and on. Then on the next line, it begins with the it's, is, is, and Sumerogram 
Gish sign, followed by the Ba sign, and again we've got the Ta sign, followed by the A ah sign, and another A ah sign, followed by We Wa Pi, followed by the Lam sign. So here I have provided a transliteration with the values of each sign, which we're going to use for our translation. So if you want to give an attempt from here, give it a go. So to start off, we're going to normalize this word to katan, lengthening both of the vowels. And even though these two are combining to one, this doesn't mean we have to lengthen it. But within context, we know that the nominative ending for the dual is going to be a long A. And we know the stem of the word is also going to require a long A. So that's why these two vowels are going to be lengthened. The next word is going to normalize to its bata, again with a long A. Now in this case, we have what's called a plene spelling. And this is a special circumstance which actually is going to suggest that it should be lengthened. And we'll see this sometimes in cuneiform where the scribe seems to have just tacked on a vowel that we wouldn't necessarily need in order to spell the word. And that's more than likely going to suggest that you're going to lengthen the vowel at the end of the word. And our last is going to be awilam. So we can translate this as katan, meaning two hands in the nominative. It's bata, which is a preterite form of sabatum, which means to seize, with a feminine plural ending. So that's suggesting that this should be an agreement with the dual nominative, and awilam, which is in the accusative. So altogether, we can translate as two hands seized a man. As always, thanks for watching.